Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming along to tonight's Research Tuesday's events, Space Makers. My name is Dr. Nigel Rogash, and I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Adelaide and SAMRI, and your host for tonight. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. Exploration is a quintessential trait of humankind. For millennia, we have walked, ran, swum and sailed to investigate new lands. Over the last century, our exploration has expanded beyond the confines of our own planet into the expanses of space. We have sent humans outside Earth's orbit and to the surface of the moon and unmanned spacecraft to other planets and outside the solar system. However, space is a hostile environment for human life. As we venture further from our Earth home and for longer periods, a major challenge is providing adequate resources to keep human space crews going through these long periods of exploration. Indeed, the success of exploration and eventual habitation of celestial bodies hinges on the capacity to recognise, extract and make use of resources from these new environments. Tonight, we'll hear from two leading experts on sustainable space resource exploration from the University of Adelaide. We'll first hear from Volker Hessel, Professor in Pharmaceutical Engineering and Research Director of the Centre for Sustainable Planetary and Space Resources. Volker is a world leader in flow chemistry and process intensification and its application to space-based industries. Next, we will hear from Associate Professor John Coltrane, Director of the Centre for Sustainable Planets and Space Resources. John has extensive international experience with defence policy, security operation, space and intelligence sectors as a senior diplomat and US Department of Defence leader. More recently, John has turned his attention to factors surrounding the commercial development of the Earth-Moon system. Each speaker will deliver a short presentation followed by a Q&A session. Thank you to those who have already submitted a question with your registration and I encourage all of our guests tonight to continue to submit questions during the presentation via the Q&A section down the bottom of your screen. I would now like to invite Volker to stage to start the night. Yeah, good evening to everyone. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak about space research. We speak about space makers and about making products in space. Now, you probably every evening look at the space and think this is an empty, starry sky. But it's not anymore. Today, we think the space is a precinct for a new economy. Now, I always loved to read the German philosophers, and I'm German by origin, and the most famous one is Immanuel Kant. That's the one who made the golden rule, if you have ever heard of the philosophy now he said, two things or me most, the starry sky above me and the moral law within me. But now it's much more than starry sky and much more than moral law. We can make products in space and we like to do. So let's go to the uh, advantages in space. First of all, space is very high, so we can observe the Earth, it's a vantage point. We use that for satellites for uh, geophysical observations and many more things. I will not talk about this today. But then we have a lot of resources in space. It's just very difficult to get them, but we run out of Earth of resources, so we need to consider space resources. Finally, we have specific advantages, and microgravity is just the most dominant one. So if you see my field, question is, can you make different chemistry under microgravity conditions? Can you make different chemistry in vacuum? And now finally, we also see space as a human destination that we may go to this planet and have inhabitation over there. Now, um, the topic of space is more actual than ever. It's a pity that I don't see you here and don't have a real audience because we're living in COVID times. And we're talking about post-COVID manufacturing. And many people, and all the Australian leaders, consider that as a step change. Here we see one of those quotes. We have to restart a lot of manufacturing. So I see space, but I see COVID as an opportunity. And I like to connect it with space and to explain you why. We go a bit away from large factories, in simple words. They are called centralized, large scale. They have a long lead time, so they are not really reacting very fast to market needs. So they are forecast driven. 
And that already started before COVID and COVID is just accelerating it. So we're looking to manufacturing, which is decentralized, lo local, resilient, self-sufficient, autonomous, and which is near the end user. Now experts call this the fractal circular economy. And that is the only mathematical equation I promise, which I will show, and it's a very simple one. It carries the basic message about a circular economy. So we want to achieve circularity and MCI is a, a, a circularity mass indicator. And we have to look to reduce waste and we have a function of our product. Yeah, my uh, mobile is to uh, connect to the internet, to talk to people. So I have a utility and I have a lifetime of my mobile. So to sum up, we can increase circularity by increasing utility and lifetime and by reducing waste. And that is a very uh, prominent definition. There are many definitions on circularity, but that is one of the most prominent ones. Now, knowing this, a lot of things are happening in Australia. This is East Pilbara. Yeah? This is some um, thousand kilometers up from Perth. And that is a very prominent mining region. And what happens there now is it develops to a bio resource precinct. And that needs a lot of energy. And the energy is now done by renewables, not by fossil fuels anymore. And just look at the number. It's gigantic. It's 15 kilowatts. Uh, uh, energy in terms of liquid ammonia is produced over there. That press release was three, three days old. So you see how actual uh, space research is. Now um, we developed a new concept which we publish soon and it's done together with the South Australian Farmers Organization, which you see here with local companies. And I don't want to talk here into detail. It's basically to produce from food waste crops over fertilizers. So it's a circular process and it uses all of those renewable energies. And if you look carefully on the right side, you see ammonia that is a key molecule as it is a fertilizer. Now we do that on Earth. And what does it have to do with space? We see over here, we like to do space farming. When humans go to space, they don't need only water and oxygen to press. They need to eat something. And we have just developed here in my laboratory a space greenhouse. I come a bit later to this. Now, um, the question is always, can you make business in space or not? At least some people are seriously uh, busy with that. And uh, I talk first on the technology and on the next slide, I think I talk about the business. So there are technology roadmaps from NASA and we follow them here. I've given a radar plot and I don't explain this in detail. You see the coding, the 71317, this is a classification. NASA operates naturally with very much normalized classified language and we work on those things which NASA thinks are important. And that is the message of this plot. Here we see it as a list. And we always have to learn space develops so much. Um, there's a new document of NASA, so we have to go on. Now NASA has also released uh, uh, documents on the economic development of the low Earth uh, orbit. And I would say it is rare, it is still too rare, but microgravity in a very rare cases is close to a business case. And one is certainly the pharmaceutical business, which is also something I'm doing. And this is given here in these two sections. Uh, people test the body on the ship. This is a simulated organs which you test and that works much, much better in space. Maybe I have later in the questions more time to explain why that is. And that experiments run in space. You pay billions for trucks and you have to pay maybe millions to go to ISS for a good experiment. So that is a business case principally. Now, um, my background is, as I said, process intensification. It's a disruptive process. And I better explain that as an example. Uh, from process intensification, I went the last 10 years to circular processing. That's what I introduced. And finally, you need hubs and habitats on space. The German word Verbund is an international word in the English language for the success of chemical integration into hubs. Now, um, where do we manufacture in space? We manufacture first of all on orbit and the ISS that is possible today. We dream a bit to manufacture on celestial bodies as it was said, but we can also manufacture on Earth under simulated space conditions. And we have very harsh Earth conditions. Think about Antarctica or deep sea, which are not so uh, far from space. And where do we want to use the space products? Naturally to be self-sufficient on orbit on the celestial bodies, 
but it's not totally far from business uh, for very tiny uh, amounts to use them on earth because you cannot make them on earth with the same quality. Now we have made some literature on this and I don't go in detail here just to show it and for those who are interested, they will find those literatures on the disruption, singularity and the habitats. Now let me start with disruption. I think it's very clear what it means, thinking out of the box, not following the same approaches. That is my message to you. If you go to space, you cannot use essentially the same techniques as you use on Earth and just optimize them. You have to use something new. And there's a lot of discussion where we should take our resources from moon, from asteroid. It's a function of distance, a function of fuel, a function of the density, a function of how you can analyze all this. This slide shows it. Let me talk about the asteroid. That's maybe a fascinating uh, story. Now, um, we use uh, process intensification and disruption, as I've said, for space minerals. And to make it a little bit clear to you, this is nickel, nickel nitrate. And we have a solution at 50 degrees, so hand warm. And if we let this uh, solution uh, come down to ambient temperature, this will happen meaning the solution is full of metal. We have a little bit water and we have uh, much metal. That's very unusual in uh, chemistry. I would say such fluids are not seen on Earth. They never have been uh, tested. Here you have some numbers just to convince those who are in the te technical business. And we want to use that to, um, uh, to process asteroids. And the best what we can do is to take meteoroids to my best of my knowledge, most of the meteoroids resemble asteroids. So we took this very famous meteoroid. Now we process in microflow reactors. And if you like to see that in real, I can show this here to you. This is the reactor in real. Microflow reactors, that's my technology, is ideal in space. Not only I say this, all experts say this, because basically you operate under microgravity conditions. Many other advantages, I have no time on this. But it's like in our lungs, we have microcapillaries. You don't think about, but in your lump, you operate under space conditions because they are so tiny. There's no gravity working. The same in this reactor. Now, what we find in this reactor, and we can use colors to make that visible, we find unusual flow patterns. I don't go into detail, so we look a lot on those flow patterns, and they are different to what we consider to be Earth fluids. Now, we want to make extraction, so we have to characterize this. We characterize extraction efficiency, the higher the better, at best 100%, and it should be selective because we have many metals on an asteroid. Yeah, We have nickel, iron, cobalt, platinum, and we have to get each of that in a pure shape. So we want here to have a high cobalt value, the blue curve, and a low nickel value, and this is exactly what we see over here. This is the R solution, that is business as usual. And then we make it for the space solution, and it's not as good very visibly, so we have to do a tough job. Yeah? We have to reinvent a bit chemical engineering and minerals processing for those space solutions. I've called that long ago novel process window. I wrote a book about it. And so we have discovered here a novel process window. And just to show it also by numbers, there's a D number. You don't need to understand what it is, but it has to do with mixing. And if we want to make extraction, we have to mix. The earth fluid has a D number of 210 roundabout. In space, it's 10. And if you want to do it green gray, it's one. So that shows you we have a tough job in space. Uh, we have to look for new processing solutions. Now, with that knowledge, we, uh, uh, we have extracted an asteroid. And you see the shiny surface that is where we have uh, removed the material. Yeah? Otherwise, we see rust. That is because of the iron content. That is the world's largest meteorite, at least to best knowledge. It came down long ago, basically at the times of Christopher Columbus, a little bit later in Argentina. And um, it is hundreds of tons, so there are a lot of pieces. And I have to thank very much to the University of Tokyo, uh, to Hirti Miyamoto, who gave me this asteroid. We dissolved this in the most aggressive solution known on Earth, that is aqua regia, can dissolve virtually anything and uh, we get, again, good extraction results for this asteroid. And our next step will be the leaching of unminable material. And I gave credits to Hiri Miyamoto. He has a whole space museum in the Tokyo Dome. If you ever go there, uh, make a visit, it's worth. Now I come to the circularity. There's a lot of phosphorus in the moon and we're running out of phosphorus on Earth. 
So we need to consider the moon resources. Now we developed here a bioprocess. You see a lot of plants, you see lettuce, you see sour soaps, and you see again the chemical reactor, which is the microfluidic reactor I've just shown you. The main point is we use the sour soaps as an acid uh, for the uh, leaching of the uh, phosphorus and we use the lettuce as a tank to store the phosphorus. This is what lettuce can do very well. It's in the roots. We don't eat the roots, so you can eat the lettuce and you can take the roots for the phosphorus. And the student made the best experiment here. Students have really great space ideas and I have to give credit to Daniel who made this experiment and we can extract uh, uh, quite some phosphorus method. Now let's go a bit further. You would not imagine that the first microgravity experiment was done when La Napoleon lived. Yes, Napoleon Bonaparte, 1806 by Mr. Knight, and he put on the spinning wheel those plants. This gives you some kind of partial gravity. Basically, you have some chaotic movements which eliminate the gravity effect. Today, we can buy such uh, uh, instruments from Airbus. Uh, it's a called random positioning machine. Now we put uh, plants on this positioning machine together with the weight research everything. And uh, we have a space greenhouse, you see the lamp here, and then we make experiments. We use this uh, slow release fertilizer, it's from Bunnings, if anyone can buy it. And you see a difference in the dissolution of phosphorus when you use zero gravity and when you use almost earth gravity. And our collaboration partner, I'm sorry for the spelling mistake, is Matthew Gilliam from weight. Now, um, that is too early. Yeah. Now, um, I'd like to talk about astro food and flavors. When we go to space, we eat usually frozen food that doesn't taste very good. I think all in space agree on that. Now, taste is a function of many, many molecules, which you see over here. So our idea and concept together with the University of Nottingham is to use a plasma that is the flowing a purple uh, beam which you see and you see it's harmless you can put it on your finger so you can put it on food now there are many reasons why food uh, can get better release of flavors when you put plasma on it we have summarized it here don't go in detail to it when we now measure these molecules yeah they are color coded this is a natural uh, product and when we put plasma obviously it's very different i go to, don't go into any details but you see you can change the flavor of a product quite substantially by applying plasma now i come to the third part of my talk and that is related to health and well-being and also to space hubs and i've deliberately called it warehouses because finally we have to come to this kind of convenience in space so it's about hubs and habitats and living in space now in space, you have a lot of diseases. This is not largely given in uh, TV naturally, but uh, it happens and it's documented in the literature. So here we have the medications of US crew members on the ISS and it's compared to the submarines and to the space shuttles. Yeah? Whenever people don't see sunlight for long, when they are in a closed space, they get pretty sick and they take a lot of medicines. And if we look a bit on the diseases, it's naturally first of all sleep, but it's allergies, skin rush, headaches, that all happen. On top of that, that people get more sick in space, the medicines are less effective, at least some of them. And uh, as a matter of fact, 25 to 75% of medicines are used by all crew members. So uh, we need stable medicines in space and that's where we work on. Now the most common form is a tablet, you all know this. The tablet is composed by exhibients who have certain functions, I don't go through them. And I have to give credits to the advertiser here, um, which always helped us in promotion of the space research. So last year, around about, uh, they published uh, the mixing moon dust into pills for Star Trekkers. And this is a launch which we will have uh, on the ISS and it might happen in uh, September or later. If you know space endeavors, you don't book a ticket with a date and with a time. Everybody in space knows that. Therefore, it's given no earlier than. It's often uh, delayed, but once the, our tablets will be on sky. Now, um, why, what do we want to make? One motivation is to build a tablet completely of lunar materials because we don't want to bring anything above. We want to use the lunar materials. And those materials can be used as exhibients. Not all of them, but some of them which are shown over here. 
you know Neil Armstrong, they brought the first uh, lunar soils. Meanwhile, we have much more uh, advanced um, uh, spectroscopic methods. So we don't need to be on moon to know what is happening there. We don't need to be on asteroids. So we have a pretty good view of what is happening there. And if you want to look on titanium dioxide, which you take every evening when you have a toothbrush, this is a white, uh, the, uh, the white product in the toothbrush, um, then you use titanium. And there's a lot of titanium. Actually, where Neil Armstrong landed is full of titanium dioxide, this part, the Mare Tranquillum. And the Clementine mission, that is the name of the satellite, gives us a good picture. And we know about other elements. So we know pretty well where the resources are on moon, at least on the moon surface. Now, knowing this, we have started with uh, Space Tango, and I have to give my credits to them, a NASA mission. I'm very proud to, to make this. Uh, it's certainly one of the first missions which an Australian researcher had. It's maybe the very first of it. And it's about the long-term stability of pharmaceutical ingredients, so of the tablet, which I've shown. We've chosen commercial ibuprofen, that is a commercial product. You see it's red outside, it's white inside. It has a coating, and we have made our moon test tablets with ibuprofen. That is one of the most commercial uh, drugs and uh, one of the best studied in uh, decomposition to UV radiation and other radiation, which we have so much in space. Now the goal is twofold, a tablet with improved cosmic ray stability and made solely of moon materials. You have to know when you eat a tablet, half of it is organic uh, on Earth. There are hardly any organics in space, not at least not on moon. So we have to make it completely of non-organic materials. And that is a big challenge naturally. So we put all those non-organic materials, which you see listed here into the tablet. We put ibuprofen, we put vitamin C, and we put some flavors into it. And with this, we sent 60 tablets inside ISS, and which is maybe a bit special, six tablets outside ISS in the real outer space. And we investigate what I've said before. A motivation is, there is some knowledge that we might have some new unseen materials on, uh, uh, on Moon or Mars. It's not completely new materials, but it's polymorph. The experts will understand what I mean, but take it as a message. There are also some new materials, and maybe we can make better tablets with those materials or other things. Now, um, we send the uh, um, tablets in a tablet blister as you buy it in your pharmacy. It's in a cube lab with space uh, Tango. And uh, we, uh, the, the uh, cube labs are operated in the destiny part of ISS. And we are also on the outer space, uh, station. And I have to give my credits to Alpha Space. That is a pretty new service to my best knowledge. And uh, it, the tablets will be brought home with the signals carrier. And then we will analyze them here in Adelaide. And I'm also planning uh, the lunar pharmaceutical factory here. So I think about knowing how we can make tablets for moon materials. How can we make a real factory on moon? That are all the operations which are made when you get finally your tablets. And I found some of them should work better in space. Some of them should work in space. And the red one is like a traffic light, uh, do not work in space. So we have an idea which equipments we can use and which equipments we can replace. Now, um, we have to um, integrate uh, manufacturing in an unhabitable way. We have to combine space farming and space mining for reasons which I cannot detail here. That is unusual. That is not typically done on Earth. But you saw in East Palpara exactly this happens. And then we can use farm containers. Look at that picture that is in the Sierra Nevada in California. You grow tomatoes at minus 10 degrees. That is possible today. So we have the equipment which can be used in space and we have chemical containers for nevonics. They call it green fertilizer over here. And we think about how to heat those greenhouses. And don't imagine them to be on the moon surface. They might be 200 meters deep because that is energetically more favorable. Think out of the box, think in terms of disruption. Finally, we need to have the whole space warehouse supply chains. When you look at this, you know, this will be not tomorrow realized in space. This takes a decade or longer to realize all of those supply chains. And space, and I think I'm at my last slide or second last, uh, needs teamwork. If you know a bit about its systems engineering, requirements engineering, that is how computers are made and how airplanes are made by huge teams. We have listed this here. 
you see a huge number of cars, a huge number of team members. And this is a real life example for our space greenhouse. And we need a center and flagship project. And John will talk about the center and about how organizations can support that. And now I'm really on my last slide. We got quite some media release, even in Germany, if you see the German title, in Argentina, all over the world. And I'm very happy that the States promotes a lot uh, the uh, space research. You see here the prime minister with the first student who ever made a space industry program of this, uh, of this state of South Australia. And we were so lucky to get this student, her name is Amy, to us. We had two TV broadcasts, three newspaper articles. And I have to say, these are all people who worked just in one year in my laboratory. So 20 people round about. And I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And I hand over to John Colton. Thank you very much, uh, Volker. That was uh, a fantastic presentation. And I, I hope you're able to see uh, the incredible accomplishments that uh, and the team that Volker is leading within what I'm uh, very quickly going to show you here is the, the organization of our center. Um, so I'm going to start off talking about this. We'll move into some other, some other topics, and we'll, we'll finish looking at some of the specific things that are happening across uh, the university, um, both uh, here and with our, our partners externally. Um, so I just want to go ahead and, and explain very quickly the genius of the way the university stood this center up. Um, they took a look at the different capabilities that were already ongoing here at the University of Adelaide. Uh, and we put on top of that uh, a coordinating structure. But what that means is that when we look at these operational modules here, uh, each and then the enabling modules, the, the modules that cut across those operational modules, um, each of these is already populated with globally recognized giants in their field like Volker uh, as the processing module lead and our, uh, and our uh, research director. Each of these modules is already populated with an entire team working on these space-related projects. So when the center was first formed last October, we didn't need to hit the ground running. It was already sprinting. And it continues to sprint every day. I don't think Volker sleeps uh, because he's in demand around the world. So he's working with, uh, with teams in Europe and Japan, et cetera. So, um, and all of our module leads are doing the same thing. So there's a lot that I could talk about here. I could talk about three or four hours worth of the, uh, of the uh, activities that are ongoing here in the center. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few of the things towards the end here. So why a center here at the University of Adelaide? I've mentioned, uh, you know, we have an incredible amount of expertise across our institutes, centers, and faculties. That's one, uh, that's one dimension. I could talk about the incredibly supportive South Australian government. They've taken a number of initiatives that are of uh, incredible value and support to us, one of which is declaring space a priority sector for South Australia. I could talk about the fact that the university is literally right across the street from the Australian Space Agency, uh, their Mission Control Center, and SmartSat CRC, and the vibrant space ecosystem that's taking shape around those entities in Lot 14. So uh, I could talk about those things. But in the interest of our younger viewers, I think what I'm going to do is talk about the backdrop What's going on in space now that wasn't happening when I was a bit younger? And it, the, the difference between then and now is incredibly significant. And what it spells for many of the people that might be paying attention to us tonight is you have a real opportunity to live and work uh, in, in the space sector, if not in space itself. Uh, and that future is uh, nearer than you, than you might imagine. So. This was only four years ago. We landed a rocket on its tail. That was something you used to see in 1950s science fiction books, but that happened four years ago. Just two years ago, we landed two of them at the same time, we being SpaceX, but uh, humanity writ large. Rockets landing on their tails. We're deploying 60 satellites at a time into space. This one particular company has 600 telecommunications satellites uh, on orbit now. And why are they doing this? Well, they want to settle other destinations in the solar system. And in their opinion, you can't do that four people at a time. They want to do it 100 people at a time. So they're developing a spacecraft that can do that. So here's one test flight a year ago. 
This is just a piece of a potential passenger section. This is what the passenger section looks like uh, full scale. And then of course, just uh, last week, um, that passenger section uh, took off and moved uh, to 150 meter test flight. There's a mass simulator on top. It's simulating the weight of the passenger section. It's flying on only one third of the engines that it is planned to fly on. So this would be a two engine out scenario, potentially it's off axis. So these are providing all kinds of challenges for the, uh, the uh, AI system that's flying this particular rocket. So this is happening right now. And these are major, major steps that people couldn't have imagined 15 years ago. Other companies are doing this. Uh, so in this case, this is Blue Origin. Uh, preparing for uh, the, uh, the advent of space tourism. Uh, but they've also got plans to build something much, much larger. So the New Glenn, uh, the New Glenn rocket is in development. Uh, we, know from, uh, we know from Blue Origin itself that they've been working on a lunar lander, uh, quite a capable lunar lander, for at least the last four years. Um, and why are, they, why are they doing this? That's because that company envisions a future where trillions of humans are living in space at multiple destinations, and they're attempting, like many other com uh, companies, to build the infrastructure that will allow our young people to uh, design and enable this future and turn it into a reality. Um, we also have, the, the, as I mentioned, uh, space tourism. So we've got the Blue Origin and the Virgin Galactic examples here. Um, and while th this, is a, this is a real market, it's been researched and studied by business schools. Um, this is something that's going to happen. Uh, but the important thing for, for you know, globally is that this is going to lead to things like point-to-point -point travel. So Sydney to London in an hour, right? And so these companies understand that, and they're researching that, and they're, they're, uh, they're attending the conferences and developing the capabilities to make, uh, to make that possible as well. So that's part of the backdrop. But what, you, what we understand is that uh, space agencies like NASA, Australian Space Agency, JAXA, et cetera, these agencies want to want to to concentrate on the cutting edge exploration type missions and the more humdrum uh, sorts of activities like running a space station in low Earth orbit or providing uh, uh, resupply of those things. They're transitioning those those operations to commercial industry. So on this picture here, we've got Axiom Space recently won, in a, won a contract to put a commercial module on the ISS. Uh, soon there will be a competition for a free flying uh, low earth orbit space station that'll be designed, built and operated by a commercial company uh, providing power, environmental systems, et cetera to multiple customers, one of which could be NASA or the ASA or someone in, in just one module as a tenant, uh, as a tenant of that particular station. Satellite servicing is real. Uh, this year, uh, we've had the first uh, satellite servicer made contact with a client satellite and helped to extend the life of that satellite uh, before it uh, eventually puts it into a graveyard orbit and then moves on to the next customer. This is an, this is an incredible uh, assist for the reduction of space debris, management of, uh, of satellite constellations, et cetera. So this has now been operationalized. Uh, we have lots of uh, cargo resupply up at this, the, the space station, the Japanese, the Russians with uh, cargo and crew resupply. And then uh, the U.S. has now uh, contracted commercial companies to provide that service. So we have, uh, we have uh, the Northrop Grumman now and uh, SpaceX cargo carriers. And then uh, Sierra Nevada hopefully coming online shortly also with a contract for this. Uh, commercial crew, so that's been in the news lately. So we have uh, Boeing's Starliner is working towards its first mission. And of course, uh, SpaceX just completed its uh, demo mission to the space station and will soon be on its operational mission carrying four astronauts up shortly. Um, we actually are bending metal on another space station. This one will be around the moon. And then yet another vehicle, a deep space vehicle, the Orion Command Module uh, is also in production uh, by NASA. But how do we get supplies to the Lunar Gateway? Once again, we've turned to commercial industry and SpaceX has been awarded the contract to provide uh, commercial uh, resupply out to the moon uh, in uh, lunar orbit. This is exciting stuff. We've got uh, 14 companies that are involved in the commercial uh, lunar payload services. So th these are companies that NASA will contract to take missions to the surface of the moon in support of the Artemis mission and other investigations. But 14 companies are inside uh, that club. 
And then we have commercial lunar human lander services with uh, three consortiums, SpaceX, Blue Origin and their national team, uh, and also uh, Dynetics uh, participating uh, in that competition. We have the NASA Viper lander. That, uh, has, that mission's just been awarded to Astrobotic. They'll be going and that'll be on the, the south pole of the moon in December of 2023. That'll be looking for volatiles in, in the south pole uh, region. We have a competition ongoing right now between commercial companies for a human rated unpressurized lunar rover and then uh, JAXA and, uh, the, uh, and, and NASA have recently signed an agreement regarding Artemis. And uh, one of the things that, that, that uh, JAXA will be providing in, in, uh, in, in uh, consultation with Toyota is a, uh, the production of a pressurized human rated lunar rover. So um, really incredible capabilities that are coming, uh, that are being made as we speak. And what's all this for? This is in support of long-term human presence beyond low Earth orbit. We've been in low Earth orbit for quite some time. There's a lot of people listening to this uh, broadcast right now who have not been alive a single day when there hasn't been somebody in low, uh, in low Earth orbit. So this is to get humans out of low Earth orbit. Um, and the only way to do that is we need to use the resources that we find along the way. So we need to use the, we need to be able to breathe and we need to be able to drink water and we need to be able to refuel our ships. And we can do that affordably if we can use the resources that we find as we venture out into the solar system. So where's one location that we might go? Um, there's a lot of places we can go, but one place that say NASA and the Artemis missions and the Viper rover are going is the South Pole of the Moon. So as we pull in on this shot um, in this NASA animation of the South Pole of the Moon and we pull in close to Shackleton Crater, uh, we can begin to understand why this area is so interesting to us. First, because it's the South Pole and because uh, the axis of the Moon is nearly perpendicular to its orbit around the Sun, um, there's really no seasons on the South Pole. So as you see, as we cycle through months and months on, on the Moon, that many of these craters never receive sunlight in the bottom of, uh, at the bottom of the crater. So what this does is it forms a thing called a, a cold trap. The temperature there at the bottom of the crater is 40 Kelvin. So any cometary debris or water that may be formed by uh, the impact of hydrogen on the surface in combination with uh, oxygen that migrates across the surface of the moon, when it encounters one of these cold traps, it falls in and it can't come out. And the, and the sun hasn't shine into that crater for four billion years. So we know there's volatiles there, or we have, it's, it's highly suspect there are volatiles there. And what can we do with water that we might find on, this, on the South Pole? Well, of course, we can, uh, we can collect that and we can drink it, we can breathe it, and we break it apart and turn it into propellant, uh, hydrogen and oxygen uh, for, uh, for rocket fuel. So it's like having a fantastic gas station uh, right there on the moon complete with its uh, mini snack bar. Uh, there's all kinds of other resources here and Volker touched on uh, uh, what else is available uh, on the moon, but there's lots of reasons to go here even in addition to, uh, in, in addition to the water. Here at the University of Adelaide, we have partners that are working on these challenging areas in the bottom of the craters. We're looking at lunar construction activities. That's one of our investigations that might occur uh, around the crater where the infrastructure will be aggregated to support any of those kinds of operations. So this is really the seeds of what could eventually turn into you know, the first city on the moon. So we're looking into those kinds of activities in addition to uh, Volker's under, un underpinning research uh, across uh, the chemical engineering aspect. So uh, we're currently um, investigating space construction activities. We're making lunar bricks out of, uh, we're making bricks out of lunar regol regolith. We're um, investigating, we're putting together a robotic fleet enabled by our computer science school and uh, artificial intelligence um, operated by our mech, uh, mech engineering folks uh, to carry out construction tasks bury with, with, these, with these components, burying them, connecting them, and building with them. But we need, you know, when we, once we're on the surface, we're going to need to do things like build roads and build landing pads and build berms and, and, and uh, all kinds of civil engineering types of things that will need to be done before we start bringing in uh, much equipment just because of the harsh nature of the lunar environment. 
We're also looking at space agriculture. Humans are gonna need to eat, and Volker touched on a number of, uh, of uh, aspects of that and how critical that is to not only human health, but the uh, psych uh, psychological health as well. Uh, we're using the talents of the mining engineering school to get at the geotech, um, the geotech properties of regolith that's buried, you know, sometimes up to hundreds of meters deep. Um, and we're looking at that iterative base design from the first time, for the, from the first component that gets landed until the point where we have a lunar city where you can buy a pizza. Uh, we want to make sure that we've built that base in a, in a pre-planned uh, manner in the most efficient way possible. So that's the, that's the prepared part of the presentation. I think we're ready to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John and Volker. Okay, I'd like to invite both of you back up to the stage and we will uh, take a few questions. And just a reminder that everyone can submit their questions uh, via the Q&A section at the bottom of the webinar there. Okay, so the first question is to you, Volker, from Andrew Paul. Uh, what are the long-term effects of microgravity? Yeah, we have uh, effects which I pointed out on the health of human beings. You get uh, diseases, you lose uh, bone material. To my best knowledge, that can be up to 10, 15% for long-term mission. The whole circulatory blood system, which is due to gravity, changes. So these are all the negative things. We have a lot of documentation on radiation effects. There's a lot of harsh radiation there. Yeah? But you know, there are also wonderful things in space, like uh, Buckminster balls, if you know what that is, is uh, like footballs. Uh, of, of carbon and they would normally be destroyed in space, but just seven to 10 micrometers mineral coating or in an asteroid helps to make that available. So there are also ways of protection. And then we have all the good effects of space. Space is good literally for anything which is a distortion. So a living object like us is a distortion. Yeah? Many things are distorted into each other and we can make much better medicine uh, uh, investigations in space because the space gives you much better tissue and we can make a, a much better food probably in space. Droplets are spherical, you think on Earth. They are not spherical. If you look very exactly, they are not and they have huge consequences. We can make larger droplets in space. You would think we need smaller. No, we also need larger ones. So we can make products in space which are impossible to make on Earth and this touches upon our most urgent need. Living, eating, it's not something which is very far and only for crazy scientists. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, the next one uh, is to, to you, John. It's from Daniel Barry. What resources would we need to extract and which celestial bodies we may find them on? Okay. Uh, thanks, great, great question. Uh, well, that obviously will change over time. But uh, one of the first things that you hear people talking about is just looking for looking for water. So, and and, and once again, I mentioned that during the, the briefing. That's you know, the water can be a, is a very good uh, propellant uh, in space, and uh, provides a lot of expendables that uh, humans would need uh, would need for uh, living. You know, but but the the underpinning is something. The underpinning factor here is that finding that in space would reduce the cost of space travel by uh, by orders of magnitude. 90% about of, of every rocket that takes off from the earth is propellant. So if you can get the propellant in space, you can, you can turn that launch mass into something really, really useful like a, you know, like a computer. So, um, uh, so those would be the first thing we go for. But on, on the moon, you, you have titanium, iron, aluminum, magnesium, uh, and other things. And then you can start going to the asteroids, which is uh, one of Volcker's specialties. Uh, the diversity uh, becomes even greater and it includes a lot of other volatiles as well. So, um, and then Mars, of course, is its own planet. So it, it has just about everything that we have here. So just a follow up question to that. So given that there are excellent uh, potential water st storages already on the moon, would it be possible to use that as, I guess, a launching pad to, to go further afield? So to, to land something on the moon and then harvest the, the materials for the, the, um, the propellant and then launch from there with that. Is that a, a sensible idea? Or? Yeah, that's certainly an idea that uh, many people have been, have been looking at. Mm. Um, you know, b before we get, and, and so yes, the, the short answer is yes. Mm. Well, we, can, uh, we can populate uh, propellant depots within the cislunar system. And some of those could be at the moon. We, uh, we can ship uh, fuel 
uh, into uh, various orbits around the Earth, and that reduces the cost. And people have talked about refueling uh, there for a Mars mission or, or something like that. Uh, w one of the only things that's uh, holding us back from committing to a plan like that is we're not exactly sure how much water is available on the moon, so uh, that'll have to be taken into account. Our center name has the word sustainable in it, and that's so we, we want to make sure that uh, that uh, once we know understand what that quantity is, that it's uh, available for future generations. So, mm, great. Okay, uh, Volker, the next one is for you. Uh, it's from uh, Chinmay Tawari. How far and feasible is the dream of achieving important chemicals pharmaceuticals in space by photoreactions? You know, photoreactions are done by irradiation and the space is full of irradiation. We have unfiltered sunlight, very logical to use that. And since uh, 50 years, we have studies on photoreaction in space. The early salute missions of uh, Russia in the uh, 70s already looked on parts of our DNA, yeah, that is our genetic code, how that is, uh, those bricks which are used, how they are influenced. And first of all, it was a lot about decomposition and to prevent that. But then with the learnings over the decades, the, the researchers built something up. And you have to know that many people believe the origin of life comes from space. Our amino acids, they are chiral, meaning left hand is not like right hand. I cannot bring it to completion. That's the whole origin of the pharmaceutical drugs in our world life. So that comes from space through polarized light. And my colleague, Aaron Bieler from Boston University with Space Tango, who I've mentioned before, they do now at ISS photochemical reactions to close peptides together. For some reason, it's very good to make peptides in uh, space that has been investigated over several decades. And peptides are a major part of our biopharmaceuticals. So pharmaceutical companies like Eli Lilly, all the big ones investigate in space and run experiments. I think at ISS don't take the number to exact 500 experiments have been made or even thousand, an impressive number of experiments in the few years. Yeah. Right. Oh, excellent. Okay, uh, next one's for you, John. It's from Richard Parton. Uh, how would water be produced sourced? Okay, uh, yeah. Um, so there's, there's a lot of people around the world working on that particular question. Um, of course, uh, so it depends on sort of the destination that you go to. I mean, if you, uh, there are some asteroids that uh, are up to 25% um, volatiles by weight. So you could theoretically wrap them in a bag and heat that, you know, allow the sun to heat it and the volatiles will bake out, so to, so to speak. Um, if we're talking about sort of these uh, lunar polar cold traps, there's a, a differing ideas about how you might be able to get, uh, you know, what we would imagine to be is, you know, ice mixed in with lunar regolith in, in something that's harder than concrete. And how might you get the water out of that? Um, thermal mining is a, is a possibility that's, that's been proposed by some and others are looking at uh, other extractive methodologies. So that, that's one way for the water. Um, looking at the regolith on the moon that is composed of all these other useful metals, that's where uh, Volker comes in with a lot of processing technology. I mean, it, it's, so the, the lunar regolith is 43% oxygen by weight, and it's in high, high in titanium and iron and all these other things. It's just laying there to be scooped up and then you give it to a person like Volker and he can actually turn it into, he can refine those metals for you, so. Great, so just a, a bit of technology and-, uh, and Many then, different pathways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, uh, Volker, the next one is for you. It's from, from Sean Simper. Uh, what methods are being considered to close the loop to reuse materials as a means of increasing sustainability? Yeah, we to make circular processes, we indeed have to close the loop. We have many technologies available, but to close the loop, we need to think a bit out of the box. And I'd like to give you a nice example. The European Space Agency does all the wonderful things. They have this so-called Melissa project in Barcelona, and it's a miniature biosphere. Yeah, you have something similar in Arizona on a larger scale. And what did they do? They put 40 rats in a space greenhouse. Why 40 rats? Because they consume as much uh, oxygen as I consume as one human. And then the out of the box thinking is to use a waste made by the rats with bacteria to liquefy it because it's difficult to transport solids. And they bring this liquefied waste back to the system. So it's a closed loop uh, system and such experiments bring us 
much, much uh, uh, further. And this shows a bit the way of thinking, not to use this heavy machinery like my phosphate proce process, to use nature basically as a good part for space uh, experiments and to use technology where we need it to split water. Nature doesn't help too much, but uh, there we need the technology. Yeah. But with waste recycling, food to waste, we can use more natural processes. Great. I wonder if you could comment a little bit further on, on some of the biospheres that are being, I guess, used on Earth as, uh, I guess, experiments for, for, uh, for some of these space missions. So, uh, so you just spoke about the one just then in, in, yeah. in Arizona. Um, so do, do, you, do you think these are going to be uh, sort of essential or useful for, for being able to, to refine these kind of technologies? Yeah, we have to solve the problem of space farming. Uh, I think to moon probably we can go and maybe bring the food with us, but it's impossible. Uh, there are calculations that you need 60 tons food and so on for six people uh, to go to Mars and uh, experts think that is impossible. So you have to generate. And there are actually uh, space greenhouses uh, which were run on a smaller, on a bench top format like this plant here uh, at the ISS. So people are working on it. But do not forget when we go to moon, we have maybe minus 150 degrees, mm. sometimes maybe plus 150. Uh, that was why I said maybe we have to engrave those units uh, uh, because on the surface we have really harsh conditions. So those biospheres from Earth, which are still operated under uh, normal gravity, we have the same experiments in space. But I would say it takes us quite a while mm. to make it. I would say we are close to mining water, what John said. And even that it's not trivial at all. But uh, the space farming will take some more years and if years are enough. Great, thanks, Volker. Okay, the next one is um, is for you, John. It's from Benjamin Lewis. Uh, do you foresee AI playing a major role in the auto automation of mineral extraction processing uh, as a precursor to human settlement? Uh, yes, absolutely. And um, like a lot of things in space, we, we can learn some lessons uh, from Earth. And obviously, AI and robotics uh, are an increasingly important um, uh, part of terrestrial mining as, uh, as, and as that technology matures, I think we see all kinds of benefits uh, for especially from the human protection and human safety aspect of uh, terrestrial mining and remote operations. So you put, you, you, you take that operation now and you put it into space, which is even more hostile ar ar arguably than, than the things that we're doing down here and it becomes even more important. So we will want to maximize the leverage and, and what we can, uh, can squeeze out of, of AI um, and robotics in pursuit of this. The, the challenge for us, I think, is gonna be just the mechanical uh, survivability of the vehicles in the harsh lunar environment. So that's gonna require us to probably concentrate on human robot teaming uh, and have humans uh, working at least periodically with the robots to make sure they can continue to operate. But the AI will be a critical enabler um, of sustaining their operations when the humans aren't there. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, just an open, open question. Um, so how would disease diagnostics be affected in space? As I said, um, one of the really business cases now is to measure disease diagnostics. They are measured as I've shown, I call it body ownership. That is if you have liver, lung, everything there. Otherwise you call it organ ownership. Many diseases are in a liver, so take a liver on a ship. And this is some liver tissue, which is in a microfluidic device, much smaller than I've shown, like a check card. And you flow through the physiological solution, your body fluid, and you investigate the disease. And since you have no gravity, which you have on us, the cells are not flattened, yeah? they, they expand naturally and all the experts or most of the experts say they get much better results in space for those experiments than on earth and that is really then a justification to go in space when you see how much money is spent for a, a truck that can be 50 billion dollar uh, dollars yeah, you have to imagine that number not million and it takes eight years typically we see now how long the covid uh, 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 vaccine takes and that is just meant for one year not eight years so such investigations, which are so important for human mankind, we better do in space. Mm. Great, thanks, Volker. Uh, scanning through some questions here. Oops. 
Tess, this is a technical question uh, for you, Volker. Do you think uh, static mixers like CFI are effective in space, even if Dean number is less than space with regard to Earth? Okay, that's a very technical question. I may explain it a bit to the audience. So when you have a microfluidic device, and I've given the D number, that is a number for the mixing, and I've shown the fluids are much more viscous, they are much more dense. So they don't behave like on Earth, yeah? imagine you have your spoon and you want to mix honey, yeah? really very viscous honey. It will not work. You have to invent something new than your spoon. So that is definitely something we have to consider to develop even more intensified devices. Yeah? We saw devices like this here. That is the best what we have, but it will not do the job in space. So my job is not uh, going out in these times. I have to invent something new to do that. Uh, better. So it's a tough job. Otherwise, we have to use more materials and then we are not so circular and we might be prohibitively costly. Mm. Okay, so a um, bit of a provocative question here. So uh, does the experience of long-term astronauts like Scott Kelly, who spent nearly 12 months on the ISS, show that space uh, can be a dangerous place for humans? So apparently Scott came back with a number of uh, very debilitating impacts on his health. And that was only from a relatively short period in space. So can you comment maybe on the, 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 the longer term health impacts of long space missions um, on, on humans? Yeah, I'm not a deep expert in those effects. And by the way, we have one of the world's experts here uh, in South Australia who has a company, Human in Space. Yeah? But what is known is uh, that um, people can have quite serious uh, diseases when they come back sometimes from the rocket uh, after quarantine. People have to support them. Naturally, you don't see that too often. Uh, uh, but if you look YouTube carefully, you will find such. Naturally, this doesn't happen to everybody, but there are quite serious effects. Uh, and I mentioned uh, 10 to 15% bone loss. Yeah? So that <laughs> I'm, I'm not a <laughs> doctor, but uh, it's clear that this has serious effects and we have to investigate that and this Australian company has got a grant from the space agency that is a good thing to look for such uh, uh, supports. Great. Okay, I'm mindful of the, the time. I think we're getting towards the, the end now. Um, so I'd like to finish off by, uh, by thanking tonight's speakers, uh, Professor Volker Hessel and Associate Professor John Colton for their intriguing glimpse into the, the future of, of space exploration. And thank you too to our audience for viewing and for your questions and comments tonight. Uh, this has been our August edition of Research Tuesdays, Space Makers. Uh, next month is our three minute thesis competition. Uh, for information on all upcoming topics, head to the Research Tuesdays website where you can go and also sign up to find out the latest information. We hope that you'll all join us again and thank you again for viewing and good night.